most honored that we can receive him today as one of our guests. Gordon, hi, how are you? I thank am you. very good, thank you. I'm thrilled to be with you and I like this tool you're using. I've been playing around like a nerd. <laughs> and stuff. So this is great. I was already sort of thinking you might be doing that. Yeah. Um, Gordon has some really characteristic things. He's sort of a very, uh, how do you say, outspoken person within the legal department of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. He's mm. been in the industry for a long time. His firm is based in California and USA, but he is for a large part of the year all over the globe, if I might say so. At least before COVID-19 you worked. Yeah, in the good old days, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grounded. Yes. <laughs> I can use it virtually anywhere, so there you go. So, Gordon, today you're going to talk about software project and distributed developers, like most of us now use by being grounded, basically. It's not just the preference of being digitally distributed, which most of us were in the past already, but it's, it's a necessity now. We can't do anything else. And in that space, people create things. There is basically the creation of intellectual property yeah. and a lot of traps that we have in the area. So I'm giving the floor to you and looking forward to what you have us to tell about that. Uh, I appreciate it. Now, let me see if I can walk the walk and, show, and share my screen. Uh, let's see here. I'm sure I can. Oh, there it is, share screen. And then we're gonna go to application window and we're gonna do this. Wow, you guys are snazzy. I, and, you know, and feel free to jump in also and kind of guide me for time and ask questions, but I, I'm just gonna start. So, yeah. so you know, you raised a great point and, and actually it, it's 100% true. The, the world, and I'll be talking about this, the world was already, when it comes to software development, distributed international borders collapsing everything else but you, you said something interesting there you know it's now what became optional or an optimized kind of thing has now become mandatory because in the us you can't leave your freaking house <laughs> so you know even down the block we're distributed and decentralized I, you know I, I own a cloud computer company and my co-workers are in west los angeles and i haven't seen them for months and it, you know, I'd like to see them. Uh, I, I just can't. So it, it's on one hand, you know, we're all having a little bit of a rough time right now. But on the other hand, it's forcing efficiencies and progress that sure were going to happen anyways. But it's making them happen, which might might actually be a good thing, because when we all cross over to the sort of virtual connected world and we get rid of the long tail of what happened before, maybe we can standardize and make this new world better. So I like I like the point you raised. So most of you are watching this are going to be one way or another involved in companies that have software development projects. Um, a, a webinar or a conference I was just in, you know, kind of attacked the idea that any company could possibly not be a tech company these days. Like literally every company is a tech company. If you're a farmer, if you're building a dam, whatever you're doing, there's so much technology and software involved. You know, there's that expression, software is eating the world, that you can't help but to be involved with it. And once you achieve a certain scale, or even when you're just starting off, you're you're going to end up customizing software or building software. You're either going to have the software built from scratch to meet your needs, or you're going to take off the shelf software, like Salesforce, Salesforce, for example, and customize it because everyone's a little bit different. Everyone needs a different tailored environment. So this thing has only become more important and more challenging. Now, when we look at software development from a legal perspective, um, the soap opera at least has two characters. On one hand, we have the client or the project. And from my perspective, or at least from this talk's perspective, you know, really depends who's paying me. Uh, from my perspective and this talk's pers perspective, the client or the project is the hero of that soap opera. And I wouldn't say the villain, but the other character that the client or the hero of the project is working with is the developer. And you can see on the screen, I kind of made these defined terms in their caps all the time, or initial capitalization, just so you can clearly tell who's who in the next slides. Now, when I say developer, developer kind of calls to mind a whole range of things. And it can be a single individual, you know, working from their home in Ukraine. It can be a large international development company with thousands of employees and staff. And you know it can run the whole gamut, but the principles behind software development 
are consistent. And this is especially true in this new international world. So let's take an overview of sort of modern software development challenges. Again, you know, exacerbated or brought to the fore by COVID. Um, there's, I kind of I have some casual terms for them. Uh, one term is developer sprawl. Um, this is the idea that this developer is no longer down the street. They're no longer some company that you have a contract with, say, you know, if I'm in America, they're in America. They're, it, these developers are international and they themselves are decentralized and they themselves are distributed. They can be a network of contracts and contractors and relationships. So you get this not company you're working with, not necessarily an individual work you're working with, but, but this amorphous cloud, this sprawl of counterparties that you're working with if you're a client or a project. That's one element. Now, this developer sprawl, these challenges are kind of interactive, or at least one leads to the next. Developer sprawl interacts directly with this sort of gig planet idea. People don't have jobs like they used to. You know, it's not the 1940s where you spent your whole life at General Motors and then retired on a pension. It seems like these days everyone is a contractor and everyone is a contractor to multiple clients. And to be an employee, especially with some kind of tenure, is fantastically rare. And the remote, decentralized, and distributed na and international nature of this world enhances that because it, it's much more difficult to have an employee that's outside of your country. I mean, are you going to set up a local entity to hire them? You're almost certainly not. You're going to contract or with them directly as sort of equal parties. So that's the what I call the gig planet phenomenon. And the third main challenge facing software projects is what I refer to as code stew, which is it's not like a nice piece of steak and you can identify that it came from this cow. And I hope I'm not offending any vegans in the audience. But you know, if you're looking at a steak, you can assume it came from one cow. When you're looking at software code, God knows where that code came from. That, that code can be something that someone else wrote 10 years ago that ended up on uh, GitHub, they got repurposed. It could be open source. You, it's really hard to trace the provenance of code, but it matters because code stew, it makes determining the ownership of code and the right to transfer ownership of that code unclear. So, you know, it's challenging, but obviously projects are happening and people are being successful. So how do we address this? Um, let's dive into developer sprawl. You know, what, what are the consequences uh, being geographically distributed. Well, you know, it's the usual. There's language issues. And these aren't necessarily legal issues, but there's language issues. Uh, there's local custom and mores may be different uh, depending on the countries you're in, and this can lead to communication problems. Uh, there's time zone variances. I mean, you know, if you're in America, do you want to be up while your Ukrainian development team is up? Do, do they want to be up while you're up? Um, different countries have different legal systems. And even when the legal systems are good and fair and fast, it's hard to enforce a contractual relationship at a distance. You know, it just is. Um, and of course, when people are physically distant and you're not in the same physical space, there's sometimes issues with accountability and responsiveness. And again, these are not purely legal issues. Everyone involved in project management, especially software development, is aware of these, but it's good to just be give a thought to the deal what the deal is with developer sprawl. Okay, so you know, how do you address developer sprawl? Well, good legal work and planning can help but it doesn't solve it. So I'm not promising to solve it, but I can help address it. Likewise, good tools like Jira or GitHub or Agile or Scrum or whatever the modern version of those things can help. The third issue, Geek Planet, let's get, dive into that a, a little bit. Again, it's very rare for developers to be direct employees of the client. In fact, it's very rare or not common for developers to be direct employees of the developer that's been hired by the client. The developer hired by the client may in fact be having their own contractors and those contractors may have contractors and it goes on and on and on so the situation you're in as a client is you rarely know the actual identity of the actual developer doing the developing it's kind of strange you know you know who emailed you or sent you the updates but you don't necessarily know who did the code and finally again code stew uh this has a couple of different facets the code stew is Number one, people repurpose code that they find online or in books or elsewhere, and they don't necessarily attribute ownership or the source. Um, code stew is caused by the success of open source software and the utility and vibrancy of open, open source software. You know, why program from scratch, unless you're IBM, I guess, um, 
when you can borrow or take from an open source software project. What makes this complex is different open source or OSS projects um, have different licenses available to them. There's an MIT license, there's an Apache license, there's several, and those licenses have different provisions. Um, there's the GPL. Those licenses have different provisions about what, what, when can you use that code, that OSS code in a commercial product? Does that code need itself to be OSS? Do you need to do attribution? You know, and it's a real thing. Now, there's a different angle to codes too, which is if I'm a software developer, I don't want to code the same thing twice. So when I get a project in, like a lawyer, I'll look to see whether I did a similar project before. And my desire is to simply take what I did before, you know, change a few lines for the new client and charge them. So you know, developers like to reuse their own code. And it's a natural thing. It's economically efficient. And it probably actually reduces bugs because they're familiar with that code. Likewise, when a developer is developing code for our hero, the client, that developer is probably going to want to reserve the right to use that code for a future client. Well, if I'm the client and I'm paying that developer to develop custom code, do, do I really want that developer to basically develop that code on my dime and then sell it to someone else? Probably not. Or at least I want to control that. So there's, there's two key client agreements uh, that are important with, with, when it comes to software development. The first key agreement is the non-disclosure agreement, or also called a confidentiality agreement. It's usually referred to it as a, a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. Then there's the second main agreement is the software development agreement. Now these things can go by different names, of course, but you know, software development agreement is a common name, and I'm going to abbreviate that in this presentation as the SDA. So let's let's talk about some practice tips that apply to both an NDA and also an SDA. So here's the general idea. You, you don't, these are important documents. You, you don't want to sort of develop them ad hoc for every software development project you as a client are engaging in. You want to invest the appropriate level of resources and time and thought to both these documents, developing good, tight, well-drafted, standardized forms. So you want to standardize NDA for your company and you want to standardize SDA for your company. And you know, how do you get the standardized if everything in life can be different? Well, when you structure these documents, and this is for the lawyers and the entrepreneurs out there, when you structure these documents, put all the generic stuff in the main document text and put all the customization into the attached exhibits and then just incorporate those by reference. That way you can save yourself a lot of time. Because every time you have a new NDA or a new SDA, you're simply changing the exhibits. You're not really changing the main agreement. And then a, a sub note on that is a good way to reference from the main agreement to the exhibits is to use defined terms in the main agreement. So for example, the very first paragraph says, I'm contracting with XYZ developer. You don't want to have the whole document be XYZ, XYZ developer because then you have to search and replace everything. So you want to define XYZ developer as the developer. Then you just have to change it once when you have a new document. So that's a general drafting tip. Also, I really like document automation. Um, where you type in answers, fill in some forms, and then it generates a document for you. And Hot Docs is a good program for doing that. Now, here's a little sneaky trick uh, for everyone out there who's a potential client. I think most of your clients do this. I mean, most of the watch people watching this probably do this already. But to be clear, you don't want to be emailing a PDF for the person to print out, sign, scan, email back, you know, that's very nice. That's very 2005. What you want to do is you want to use an online execution tool like DocuSign. And then people can electronically sign these documents and you'll get them back. Of course, there's the obvious efficiencies involved in doing that. But what's neat about DocuSign and other tools is you can set the signing order. So if you have multiple parties, you can mandate that the other party has to sign first and then it comes to you for a signature. So that's a neat little thing. Also, psychologically, uh, the recipient of agreements on DocuSign is much less likely to aggressively negotiate every term. When you email them a document, whether it's a Word document or a PDF, you're asking, kind of begging for them to make comments. You're opening yourself up to them making comments. If you send it by DocuSign, it's a little bit more of a process 
and it's less likely that they're going to fight back as hard on particular terms. And so long as your documents that you're sending are reasonably fair, then it's a good result for both people. It actually just makes the whole process much more efficient. Okay, now let's talk about NDAs specifically. When do you have your developer or prospective developer sign the NDA? You want to do it right from the start. You want to say, hello, nice to meet you. I have a potential project. Before I discuss it with you, you know, please execute this NDA, right? Because if you don't, if you do it later, it becomes unclear where the dividing line is between the confidential information and the non-confidential information. So basically, when you talk to the developer first, it's like name, serial number, email address, and keep it there until you've assigned NDA. Now, NDAs are relatively short documents, you know, three, four pages. They don't, you don't go crazy with your NDA. You want them to be tight, but you want them to be fair. You know, what why fair? You know, what, you know, why am I a lawyer saying be fair? Well, the first thing is you don't want to scare away developers, and they should be scared away by overly aggressive NDA. I've had clients I told to turn down deals because the NDA was stupid or too aggressive. So, you know, if you want to work with someone, don't be a jerk. Send them something fair. Send them something balanced. Also, when you get too aggressive with an NDA, you, it may not be enforceable. It may be an unreasonable restraint on trade or something like that. So you want it to be tailored. Um, and I guess my final tip when it comes to NDAs is don't just go online and find one and just reuse it. You want an NDA that's specifically tailored for software development, okay? Not a generic one. Generic ones are not terribly enforceable. All right, I think can we help? Okay, so there's NDAs. Now, SDAs generally, this is the key document. Your client's company's life depends on it. Because if you have holes in your software development agreement, it can be a disaster for your company, especially if it gets into intellectual property litigation. So you, you have the NDA before you start talking about the project, but you have the SDA before any actual work is done on the project. Before money changes hands, before the developer develops, you need a signed SDA in place. And this document, you know, is going to be more aggressive because it has to be to protect the client than the NDA. So that's SDAs in general. Now, I can't go over, over every facet of SDAs, of course, but here's some key issues to pay attention to. Really key is who owns the work product that the developer is developing? Keep in mind that if a developer is not, you know, at least under US law, if a developer is not your employee, if it's a contractor, for example, okay, everything they do belongs to them, but even if you pay them to do it, okay, there's something called the work for hire doctrine. So unless you contract otherwise, the default rule is if you pay a developer to develop something and they give it to you, they're really just giving you a license. They're not giving you ownership. So you need to be real clear about your ownership expectations in your SDA. Who owns the result? Are you the client receiving a license or the actual product? The, you know, there's that kind of great interesting thing with Microsoft and IBM back when Microsoft was taking off. They, did this kind of judo on IBM where they licensed the software or you know got the ability to license software and IBM said oh we don't care about that we just care about hardware well you know look at IBM now and look at Microsoft now so that's a key issue another key issue fees and expenses clearly want to allocate those you know who's paying for what also the timing of payments and the you know and when do expenses get reimbursed do I submit a receipt and then, you know, if I'm the developer, do I submit a receipt, get paid a year later? I mean, how long should it be? You also want testing and acceptance of the software. You, the client, shouldn't just take whatever the developer gives you. You should have the right to review it, have it audited, and have a formal acceptance process. And silence should not equal consent. You should proactively test that software and have the right to do it. And this all kind of generally falls under the rubric of you want to allocate risk and liability intentionally and in the document. Now, drilling in on key representations and warranties in the SDA, you want to be you want the developer to warrant the quality of the services and the deliverables. It can't be junk. It has to be good code. It has to be best practices. Or if there's a reason not to, you need to talk it through and then document it. They, of course, want to include something that does include viruses or other malicious code. I've never actually seen a software developer include viruses or malicious code intentionally, but you know sometimes they have rogue employees. And if they do, or they put in a backdoor and it gets exploited later, 
you want the developer to be to indemnify the client. In other words, make the client whole in the case there is a virus or malicious code. And this last one is extremely key. You must have the developer represent and warrant that the code that they're delivering to the client does not infringe on any third party's rights, especially and including intellectual property rights. That includes open source software, okay? That includes former clients. The developer has to have the legal right to give you, the client, what they say they're giving you. And they have to represent and warrant explicitly that that's the case. So let's talk about, you know, remember I said you want a generic, if you're the client and you're doing a lot of software development, development remember you want a generic software developer agreement. So you don't have to hire a lawyer every single time and just drive yourself crazy. Most of your customization is gonna go into the main exhibit to the SDA. And that's almost always called the statement of work. You know, call that exhibit A, the statement of work. That's your main customized exhibit. In your statement of work, you wanna have detailed milestones of the project. You know, and you wanna divide it up. Phases, prerequisites, timing, all that other good stuff. Really include the timing. You don't want timing for the end product, you want timing for each milestone. And you want consequences or cures if timing is lost. You know, and sometimes timing should be lost. If the developer finds something legitimate, brings an opportunity to make it better to the client, and the client wants things to be better, you know, sometimes it may take more time, but that's okay. You just need a written way of managing that. And that kind of leads to the next point. You, if something goes wrong, you know, all these agreements I see from other lawyers, you know, say, you know, the, the developer has to do certain things, but doesn't say what happens if the developer, developer fails or neglects to do those things. You need some method of addressing deficiencies. You need, a, you need notice, you need cure. You need what happens if the developer doesn't fix it in time. You need dispute resolution. Um, you know, it, it really matters, especially if the, what the developer is developing is the key business proposition of your company. Now, this is a little bit less related to the SDA, but just a generally good idea. And you want to have a provision about this in your SDA. You absolutely want third-party source code escrows. You don't want the developer sort of like shipping you when they feel like it, the most recent version or sharing a screen with you, but never actually giving you the software. That's a bad idea. Okay, the developer can hold you, the client hostage by not delivering software, kind of like, you know, someone fixes your house and refuses to put it in the bathroom. The developer can disappear. The developer can become unavailable. They can go bankrupt, you know, they can die, who knows? So you absolutely want a third party co you know, company that the developer is going to check the software into that that software or that code is available to you, the client, no matter what. Um, it helps for versioning. It helps for track, tracking progress and seeing if those milestones are being achieved. So you're not just getting words from the developer, but you're actually seeing it. It's good for code auditing because if it's checked in, you can check it against open source software. Um, it's just a very useful tool. So that, of course, is going to be a separate agreement with that third party, but you want to include in your software development agreement that you're going to require a third party source code escrow and you want some sort of cost allocation. You know, maybe the client should pay for it. Maybe the party should split the fees. Um, I actually think it's more fair for the client to pay for it, but different people have different opinions. But it's, it's just a great tool. And I think I did that in my 15 minutes. So I'm going to open it up for questions and pass the microphone back to you. And I spoke, I know I spoke fast. I had to get through all this, but I'm happy to share the deck. I'm putting the camera on as well. Hi, that was great. Thank you so much. It sure. also made a perfect connection to one of our other speakers later, which is Sebastian van der Lans, who is representing WordProof, nice. uh, the completely new development within DocuSign. In Europe, in some instances, um, you have to paragraph, you know, all pages of legal contracts. Mm -hmm. so time stamping each page into a different phase or content or articles or lots of, I would say, fixing in time that this at this moment was mine or mm -hmm. this at this moment was this version. We, of course, have to, um, you know, some some things like um, how do you how would you spell that things that are sort of common knowledge mm -hmm. that people say, oh, but I didn't know it was yours or whatever. So you see this product. Sorry? Like chain of title slash origin. 
Right, right. Yeah. You, you're putting everyone on, I guess I call it constructive notice. They don't have an excuse for not knowing anymore. Yes. Right? Well, these articles are all at the bottom labeled, like, you know, that there are time stamped on word proof and that people can prove that they actually did the article in this fashion because also in cases that things are changed later on and mm -hmm. people make it look like you were the one writing it or you right. were the one doing this, that you can prove no. It was not me, it was somebody else, because when I did it, it looked like this. So it's a great link to what, what WordProof has been doing in the past um, already. It's an operational piece of software. I like it. It's a lot better than DocuSign because I get them a signature page like is very used in America. Mm. In Europe, they're not accepted in a lot of cases. It's typical Anglo-Saxon law because in Germany, you have to do every single page of the whole thing. They won't well, accept let me, I'm very interested in the project you're mentioning. What, what I do with DocuSign is I have the party's initial every page. You can do that. But, yeah. it, but you're right. It's an option. It's not a mandatory thing. So no. I, I always make it so my client signs last, and I always make it so both parties initial every page. Yeah. Well, I think you'd be really interested in some of the new possibilities to hash it on the blockchain, and you know, because DocuSign is not a blockchain product in 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 that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a combination. I mean, blockchain is in the background with this product, sure. so it's not so much that you know, oh God, let us do this on the blockchain. Blockchain is used because it's incorruptible. You can, you know, timestamping is of course older than than you know just today is right. one of the origins of bitcoin as such that we knew timestamping is integrated in that but i think it was remarkable that you was just going into the direction of dokusan i didn't know that the other main thing that i wanted to ask you about um what happens if you put uh, an nda out and it's ignored i mean you go to court but in a lot of cases um how, how do you prove it's been violated um, well, the, the last thing you want to do, you know, you don't want to go to court, okay, in general. That's what I say. What should you be watching out for? What should you basically be stored, oh. like a better explanation, to avoid you getting there? Well, you know, so I'm going to say this from the client's perspective. NDAs are useful not just to enforce non-disclosure on the developer or prospective developer. It can have, you can use it strategically to send it to the developers connections clients whatever say you are now informed that this developer has signed this nda we have reason to believe that this developer is is violating it by using our intellectual property you don't want to say this casually you want to do it because you know it okay if you participate in this breach of contract we're going to hold you liable also okay part of my french that will cause a shit storm for the developer this is like a nuke. You really don't want to use this, but if they're, you know, going rogue with the software you paid for, you know, have at it. I've done this. Okay. You know, dear third party, you know, you know, you are now inducing a breach of contract. Okay. You're going to be subject to damage. And, you know, usually the clients have deeper pockets than the developers. And that that's, you know, there's that's a clutch, you know, that's a sort of Damocles you can hold over their head. And it's appropriate to do it if the if the developers really abscond it. Um, also, almost every NDA has specific language in there that says both parties recognize that irreconcilable harm can happen if the receiving party discloses this information. Therefore, the giving party has the right to go get an injunction. In other words, go to court and get an order that directs the disclosing party to no longer disclose or to return the information or something. You don't need to wait for a court case to play out. So you you file for what's called a preliminary injunction. The court, I, you know, the, the example that you mentioned of Microsoft mm -hmm. and IBM is a classic in our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was we pointed out to another classic. I know this will appear to you, but this is a Rolls Royce case. Do you know that one? I do not. Tell me. Okay, Rolls oh, Royce wow. was selling up a couple of years back, and mm -hmm. then Volkswagen bought everything, mm -hmm. but they to buy the name of Rolls Royce and BMW bought it after they collected all the money from uh, Volkswagen. So the whole new operation of Rolls Royce is a BMW thing, and most people know that. What most people don't know is that pr prior to that, Volkswagen bought the whole shop, and they basically didn't get the brand. 
I, I, I call that sneaky lawyer tricks. It's just, I was looking at that case on an, a BBC documentary and was like amazed at how such enormous law firms can still, you know, basically not aware of what was going on. They just didn't buy the brand. It, it, and it, it happens all the time, all yeah. the time. I I like, didn't well, have I'm, I'm a big fan, that's why I put it in the presentation. I'm a big fan of checklists and people, you know, you know, when you work with the same document, you get blind to it after a while. It's yeah. it's hard, especially if your life is working with documents like my exciting life is. Um, <laughs> but checklists are good. And you know, here's a little tip for you know document drafters out there. Two tips: have a checklist that randomizes the order. You can do this in Excel. Okay, yeah. that's what keep fresh in your mind. That way, you won't skim to the part you know. You know, you randomize the order. You're like, oh yeah, ooh. and then. Tip number two for document drafters is when you're when you're reviewing a document, read from the bottom up. Okay, your brain will not then get a narrative flow because it's disjointed, and it will keep you focused. But you're right; it's just it, it you know intellectual property has bite so many ventures in the butt. Pardon my French, you know, including maybe especially the big ones. You know, I especially weird. the big. You know, some of the other tricks that you said, standardization, I'm a big fan of that. The more you standardize, the less accidents can happen within the company of good, willing, but unaware employees who just made a deal and is just not aware what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So the more standardization you have in terms and conditions in your contracting, the less likely that these things go wrong. So I fully acknowledge what you just said in there. One of the I, other things... Let me, let me yeah. clear up your point just there. The, you know, of course, not one size fits all, but that, but, but that doesn't mean you have to do a fresh customization. What I, what I do with Hot Docs autom automation, it works well with standardization because suppose you get to paragraph 10 and there's really paragraph 10 has three common situations. Okay, with, with Hot Docs, for example, when you go through the document, it will actually pop up a window saying, okay, choose one of these three clauses. So it kind of forces your brain to think about it rather than having, you know, write a document, hey, be careful here, you may have to customize. It's actually the system that we used to have before everybody had a personal computer because you had these checklists and you could do the tick box that you want the secretarial services to work out in the contract. Remember those days? I can remember still I remember now. those days. You, you and I, Pierce, yes. Yeah, I know that. That's exactly the same system, but then automated so you can have no typos anymore in the text. It's much better. Yeah. I want to thank you a lot for your contribution. Hope to see you soon back on any of our interviews at cloud conferences to talk about the legal aspects. It's becoming, in my view, increasingly important in today's cryptocurrency and blockchain world uh, with basically the regulatory systems trying to catch us in situations that are not really fitting to our new developments and our new industry. Right. My general feeling about this, but that's a topic for next time, is that we should more go into a conceptual uh, idea of what the appropriate meaning of our laws should be. And that great ties in with what Eric, you said, that's an appeal to being responsible and having ethical principles and not trying to sort of skip around the intentions that were originally made with the law. Um, that would be a great thing to go about next time. I wanna thank you a lot for attending, Gordon. I know you're extremely busy, so thank you so much for attending this conference. I really appreciate it. And, you know, hope to see you soon in some possibility to make, you know, ends meet at a summit or a conference somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make my way to you. That, that's my goal. Thank and, you. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And it's good to see you. <laughs> okay. See you soon, Gordon. Thank